Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast, Season 2. In this episode, we discuss the prosecution's argument that Jeremy Bamber had used two of the ground floor windows at White House Farm to gain entry and exit from the house. The supposed entry point was the shower room window and the alleged exit point was the kitchen window. Here we set out the evidence, including the scenario of the windows, the hypothesis for which originated from the future beneficiaries of the estates. They were the extended family, the Eatons and the Bowflowers. This scenario was later expanded upon by Jeremy's ex-girlfriend, Julie Mugford. Essex police maintained that the evidence regarding the entry and exit points to the house first came from the information provided by Julie Mugford after she was taken in for questioning on the 7th of September 1985. But this is contradicted by other evidence. We believe that there is a strong possibility the jury were misled on this issue, as they were not told about the experiments conducted on the windows by the relatives within days of the tragedies. Was this a deliberate tactic to distract the jury from questioning the financial motives of the wider family in their quest to ensure Jeremy was convicted? The disclosed evidence shows that it was only after the date of Jeremy's release without charge on the 13th of September that the key police officers and relatives began to raise brand new speculations which they had never raised before. It was also at this time that the relatives began to give testimony regarding the windows of the farmhouse. This happened as a result of requests made by DS Jones and DSI Ainsley, who both appear to have had more than a professional relationship with the Eatons and the Bowflowers. The prosecution's case relied on the evidence presented to the jury that the kitchen window was Jeremy's means of exiting the house. It was claimed that by banging on the window frame, the catch could be made to fall into place, giving the appearance that the window had been closed from inside the house. They asserted that Jeremy had entered the house by sliding a hacksaw blade between the catch and frame of the downstairs bathroom sash-style window in order to slip the catch and allow the window to be opened. The police and prosecution arguments regarding the windows were never proven and speculative evidence was put before the jury. Experiments conducted by the police on the kitchen and shower room windows over the course of time caused damage, and yet this was presented as being caused as a result of Jeremy forcibly entering and exiting the house. In recent years, during detailed studies of the disclosed material, we have uncovered multiple pieces of brand new evidence regarding the window issues, which proves that not only was the jury lied to, but there was gross interference with the scene by Essex police officers. This tampering occurred with both windows. The kitchen one, to a lesser extent, but the shower room window was interfered with multiple times, resulting in damage to the catch and frame, which was ultimately blamed on Jeremy and used as proof he forcibly entered the house using this window. So why did Essex police do this? The answer is simple. In order for Jeremy to be presented as the perpetrator, there had to be a way that he entered and exited the locked and bolted farmhouse undetected. We begin by setting out the position of the windows recorded by police officers on the 7th of August 1985, and then weave our way through the evidence. This demonstrates how Essex police deceived the DPP and the court regarding the windows. Officers at the scene described the doors to White House Farm as locked and bolted from the inside. The windows, apart from the one in the main bedroom upstairs, were securely closed. DCI Taft Jones examined every window in the house at 9.15am as he testified in his witness testimony dated 16th of September 1985, in which he stated, I entered every room in the house, and on the ground floor, all the windows in the house were secure and locked. This was reiterated in an interim report written by DSI Ainsley to the Director of Public Prosecutions, also in September 1985, 
in which he wrote, At about 7.30am that day, the firearms group forced entry via the back door, having previously established that all doors and windows on the ground floor were shut and secured. These statements were further strengthened by the following conclusions used by Ainsley, that, on the arrival of the police, the house was found to be totally secure, with all the windows allowing access in the closed and latched position. The front door locked and bolted from the inside, the scullery door bolted on the inside, the rear kitchen door locked from the inside with the key in the inside of the lock. On the arrival of the police, the house was found to be totally secure with all the windows allowing access in the closed and latched position. A study of the evidence released in 2011 additionally reveals that in 1991, a state beneficiary, Robert Bowflower, admitted that he approached D.I. Miller within days of the tragedies to insist that Jeremy must have used the windows to enter the house. At this point, Miller informed him, Essex police had discounted theories of anyone entering or leaving by the windows, saying police sophisticated equipment had not detected such tampering. It was explained at the trial that the three senior police officers had all stated in evidence the windows to the White House farm, with the exception of the sash window in the main bedroom on the first floor, were all locked and secure on their catches. Julie Mugford claimed that Jeremy told her Matthew MacDonald, the alleged hitman, would enter the house using the kitchen window and exit using the downstairs bathroom window. In her statement of the 9th of September 1985, she testified that he said he had found a way in through a downstairs window, which I think he might have said was a kitchen window. He said they would all be shot. He told me he could get out of the house through a window, which the latch would close when the window was closed. He said as you closed the window, the latch closed, making it look as if the window had never been opened. Furthermore, in her statement two weeks later, Mugford added, He then told me that he had arranged with Matthew how to get in and out of the farmhouse via the kitchen window, where to find the gun and the ammunition, and where everyone was sleeping. Surprisingly, even though by this time the police knew that Julie's story about a hitman's involvement was untrue, because the alleged hitman had an alibi, the police, and ultimately the Crown, still included her hitman scenario at trial. However, it wasn't long before Essex police realised that it was impossible to enter the house using the kitchen window, and this was confirmed by Jeremy's cousin, Anthony Pargeter, who stated, It was possible to go out of this window and shut it and tap the window so that it locked and could not be opened from the outside. Therefore, with this now proven to have been impossible, Essex police opted for the downstairs shower room window as the one they then concluded must have been used to enter the house, whilst the kitchen one was used to exit. During a meeting that David Bowflower attended with the police on the 9th of August, along with his sister and Anthony Pargeter, he admitted that entry and exit to the house could be done using a hacksaw blade to slip the catch. This detail was given in evidence during the 1991 City of London police investigation. The evidence we now have available relieves that D.S. Jones, Anne Eaton and Julie Mugford had been in discussions together. D.S.I. Ainsley, D.S. Jones and P.C. Barlow had a close relationship with Robert Bowflower and without there being a means of entry to and exit from the house, there was no possibility that Jeremy would or could be charged. This indicates that Anne Eaton and her father Robert were fed information by the police following requests for them to begin to discuss the kitchen window in statements provided after the 13th of September. This is apparent owing to the description of the window made by DSI Ainsley and the interpretation of his meaning by the relatives. For example, in his reports written for the DPP, Ainsley referred to the kitchen window as the fan light. 
Seemingly, Anne Eaton took this literally, assuming that Jeremy squeezed through the tiny fan-like space as she wrote in her statement of the 16th of September 1985. My father and I then entered the house and checked the windows in the kitchen. I opened the fan-like window, positioned over the kitchen window, which looks onto the backyard. I then went outside and closed the window after setting the catch first. The window, on being closed, secured itself so that it couldn't be opened again from the outside. There would be sufficient room for a person to exit from the house using this fanlight window space. Therefore, it seems that she took the words fanlight window literally, and no one could have possibly squeezed through, as there was only enough room for the cats. Robert interpreted this information differently and began to include information in statements such as Inspected the windows in the White House kitchen where my daughter Anne demonstrated how to close the fan light over the kitchen sink from the outside and leave it in a locked position. The latch on the casement window could easily be closed by an arm through this fan light. Eaton and Bowflower both admitted in 1985 that they had raised concerns regarding the kitchen window with D.I. Michael Barlow of Essex Police. In his witness statement of the 21st of November, Barlow discussed tests he had conducted on the kitchen window on the 22nd of August. Following information received from the Bowflowers and Eatons, he stated, On examination of the large three-pane window, I found that the metal catch was slightly stiff and when fully opened, stuck in the open position. This enabled the window to be closed from the outside of the premises and by tapping the frame in the area of the catch, I found that the catch dropped into the lock position, giving the appearance that the window had been locked from inside the premises. It is not known how Barlow gained entry to the house in order to conduct his experiments on this day, as there is no evidence in any police, forensic or civilian witness statements that Anne Eaton was present when these experiments were conducted, nor does Barlow refer to anyone being present. In his statement to the Metropolitan Police in 2002, he admitted for the very first time that his examination of the windows at White House Farm were conducted without the instruction or authorization of a senior officer. Barlow revealed that the officer who was in charge of the investigation at that stage, DCI Jones, had been unaware of my going into the farm and conducting the tests. When he found out, he gave me a proper dressing down. He was angry that issues were still being investigated. Further, also revealed for the first time in 1991, Anne Eaton confessed that additional unauthorised and secret experiments were conducted by Essex police officers on the kitchen window. These actions were witnessed by Anne Eaton, as set out in her 1991 notes, in which she revealed she not only witnessed Essex police officers climbing in and out of the windows at White House Farm, but was instructed by the police to remain quiet about what she had seen. She wrote, Windows. D.S. Jones asked if we had spoken with Julie about windows. We, the family, said no, we hadn't spoken to anyone. As she had said something about window, right window, in kitchen, dirty marks. Robbie, Sergeant Robbie Carr, in kitchen, got out through same window. D.S. Jones said, can't put that in. Oddly, none of this information was included in her final statements to the City of London Police in 1991, and there are facts that she chose not to disclose at the time of the initial investigation, or to the court. Why did she remain quiet about this until 1991, when her father Robert was under investigation by the City of London Police? This evidence regarding Barlow and Carr reveals that at least two unauthorised experiments were conducted with no other officer in attendance. Likewise, no one with forensic skills was present, and therefore the results and the actual tests themselves should not have been presented to the jury as experiments that were properly conducted, and the results should not have been admissible.
A revelation was made by Barlow at trial regarding a second catch on the kitchen window. However, Rivlin, Jeremy's defence QC at trial, failed to realise the significance of this evidence and it was not explored. Although the trial transcript of Barlow has never been disclosed, prosecution trial notes were among the documents disclosed for the first time in 2011. In these previously unseen notes, Andrew Munday for the Crown included the evidence provided by Barlow. During his testimony, Barlow was shown a photograph of the kitchen window and was asked to describe the tests he had conducted and the results he achieved. He explained to the jury that the side catch was stuck in an open position slightly below horizontal. There was one poor quality photograph taken some distance away from the window and at an angle. It was the only photograph of the kitchen window shown to the jury. The angle this image was taken from makes the catch on the side of the window appear to be slightly closed in the seven o'clock position. However, following disclosure in 2011, a further image was discovered taken from the dairy located directly opposite the kitchen. The angle that this image is taken from is 90 degrees from the window, from a face on angle to the window, and clearly shows the window is securely closed with the catch in a fully vertical position. Had the jury been shown this image, it would have undermined the prosecution case. Did the judge have doubts regarding the credibility of the window evidence? It appears this may have been the case. As in his summing up at the end of the trial, Justice Drake stated to the jury that How he got there and out again, whether by the kitchen window or any other means, though of interest, cannot affect the outcome of this case. This was blatant misdirection, because if Jeremy could not have entered and exited the house without detection, then the perpetrator must have been inside the house. Evidence that is conducive of Jeremy's innocence and Sheila's culpability in the shootings. According to the notes, Barlow also briefly referred to an additional catch on the same window. This was a catch that ran horizontally along the windowsill and attached to a retaining peg fixed in the sill. A single sentence in the note states, Barlow said that he could not get the bottom catch back on the peg from outside the house. This evidence was of huge importance as the prosecution maintained that this window was the exit used by Jeremy. The reference to this catch revealed by Barlow was not questioned or progressed in any way and it appears that the defence did not realise the significance of what DC Barlow said at the time. The jury were not shown any images of the kitchen window in which a bottom catch was easily visible and both the defence and Crown simply focused on discussing the side catch. On close examination of the crime scene photos, it is just possible to see the lower horizontal catch that lies flush to the windowsill. This catch appears to be flat, closed and on its peg. It is not raised in any way to indicate that it was open and not secure. A photograph taken on an unknown later date shows that this bottom horizontal catch and exposes that it would have been very noticeable had this horizontal catch not been secured onto its retaining peg, not only on the photographs but to the naked eye. Therefore the catch was and must have been seen to be closed onto the retaining peg and therefore this window cannot have been used as a means of exit. And remember Ainsley and Jones had already said that all the window catches were secure, as described by Ainsley. On the arrival of the police, the house was found to be totally secure, with all windows allowing access in the closed and latched position. Therefore, if there was no way out of the property without detection, the evidence can only support that the perpetrator must have been inside the house, and further supports that this was Sheila Caffell. The prosecution informed the jury that the window catch of the downstairs shower room window was found scratched and damaged 
and items on the windowsill were covered by the hanging net curtain. They asserted that this was the obvious entry point to the house used by Jeremy. The scratches to the catch and paintwork were, they said, caused by Jeremy using a broken and rusty hacksaw blade to slit the catch. Indeed, in October 1985, such a hacksaw blade was discovered outside this very window in clear view. Oddly, many earlier inspections of the exterior of the house had failed to notice this hacksaw blade later found underneath the outside of this window. However, the disclosed case material reveals that the damage to this window catch and the painted window frame was nothing to do with the incident, but was caused as a result of the window catch being removed on multiple occasions by Essex police officers. The windows were a feature of the 2002 appeal, in that the defence complained that whilst they were aware that scenes of crimes officers had carried out a thorough examination of the house on the 8th and 9th of September 1985, at no time pre-trial was it admitted that specific attention was paid to entry and exit marks at White House Farm, nor was it disclosed that these police examinations had not revealed any scratch marks on the bathroom window. Additionally, the defence put forward that Barlow's examination on the 22nd of September, in conjunction with an extract of Ainsley's report, had not been disclosed. This issue was rejected by the appeal at the time, who stated that it follows that any failure to disclose earlier examination of windows cannot affect the safety of this conviction. However, the fresh evidence we now have undermines the decision of the appeal court judges because it shows that the window was subjected to tampering and as this evidence was never disclosed, it certainly does affect the safety of the conviction. Scratch damage the catch and paintwork of this window was noted for the first time on the 1st of October 1985 by Essex police officers and Huntingdon forensic scientist Brian Elliott. Case documents reveal this damage was not present at any of the August or September window examinations. On the 22nd of August 1985, the shower room window was examined by Barlow, who recorded no entry marks associated with the bathroom window. This examination was not authorised, a fact that Barlow confirmed in 2002. The fact remains that there was no damage, and clearly Barlow, who appears to have assisted the Bowflowers and Eatons in whatever way possible, would have made a very close inspection. But nevertheless, he said, the examination had not revealed any scratch marks on the bathroom window. In addition, the evidence was also noted that on examination of the same window, conducted on the 8th 9th of September, there was still no physical damage to the frame or the catch. So how and when did this damage occur? There appears to have been just two officers involved in this evidence fabrication, D.I. Cook and D.S. Davidson. According to forensic scientist Elliot, he attended White House Farm with Cook and Davidson on the 1st of October and stated that, I also examined the window catch and surrounding area of the downstairs bathroom toilet sash window. I noted that the brass catch had been scratched on the inner edge and that there was damage to the white paintwork on the adjacent faces of the top of the bottom sash and the bottom of the top sash. Elliot additionally admitted that the catch was not attached to the window at this time, and he had to reattach it in order to make an examination. He informed the jury, It had been removed, but I did place it back on the window for a full examination. In a witness statement of December 1985, Davidson set out that Cook handed him the scratched and damaged window catch, referenced then RWC slash 8, whilst they were both present at the farm that day. However, in his trial evidence, Davidson stated this occurred on the 14th of September and not the 1st of October. But there is even more conflicting evidence in that Cook advised the trial that the first time he removed the window catch 
was on the 27th of September. The conflicting evidence regarding what appears to have been multiple occasions, this catch was removed and then it reattached, has never been challenged. It is only from the detailed examination of the evidence relating to this issue that has now allowed the anomalies to be realised. No logical explanation, in fact no explanation at all, has been offered by Essex Police for the necessity to remove and then refit the bathroom window catch on at least three occasions. It is clear from the evidence provided from the examination on the windows on the 22nd of August 1985 by DC Barlow and the examinations that were conducted on the 8th and 9th of September 1985 by Essex Police that no damage had been found to the paintwork of this window and likewise the window catch appears to have also been undamaged at this time. The damage present on the 1st of October therefore could only have resulted after the incident, possibly in the numerous police experiments in removing and reattaching the catch at least three documented times. D.I. Cook removed it for the first time on the 14th of September and gave it to D.S. Davidson. The catch must then have been reattached as Cook removed it for a second time on the 27th of September 1985 and it was reattached and removed for a third time by Brian Elliott on the 1st of October 1985. The evidence of damage on the catch, which appeared weeks after the tragedies, was not forensically safe and should not have been used in evidence at trial. Neither should it have been suggested to the jury that the marks on the paintwork of the window or the scratches on the window catch were in any way connected to the crime. In his summing up, the trial judge incorrectly and perhaps deliberately stated that the scratches were seen on the downstairs bathroom window when it was examined immediately following Julie Mugford changing her evidence. The judge stated, After Julie Mugford had been to them, Essex police, and told them what the defendant had said about getting into and out of the house, the police went to have a look at this window. Detective Sergeant Davidson went to the downstairs toilet window and there found what he was looking for, scratch marks. The trial judge put forward an incorrect scenario. He misdirected the jury to believe that the scratches existed on the window weeks before they were actually present. This account, in his summing up, can only have caused the jury to wrongly believe the damage was caused during the incident. It was impossible to have left the house, leaving the two kitchen window catches secure, as the police found them. There was no damage to any of the windows or the paintwork of the window frames on the 7th of August 1985, and yet, by the time of the trial, Essex police had obtained what they put forward as convincing evidence through fabrications and deceit. Had the jury known that at least four examinations of the windows had failed to see any signs of damage or tampering to the windows to the windows between the 7th of August and the 9th of September, would they have still convicted? What if the jury had also seen the photograph taken from the dairy of the kitchen window, which proved the catch was completely vertical, a position which could not be achieved from banging the frame from the outside? Had they known that the horizontal catch was also fully closed, also impossible to do from the outside, then they would have realised that no one had exited the window and therefore the perpetrator was still inside the house and had never left. Therefore, the person who carried out the shootings was Sheila. If you want to lend your support to Jeremy Bamber, you can write to him in the UK using the number A5352 AC HM Wakefield 5 Love Lane Wakefield WF2 9AG or see our website for details at www jeremy-bamba.co.uk